Well, hello everybody and welcome to yet another edition of Crossworlds, the program where we focus on the greater metaverse, um, the, the world of virtual worlds beyond uh, Second Life and also uh, augmented reality and interfacing technology of the future. My guest today, um, to many of uh, people in Second Life, needs no introduction. His name is Dizzy Banjo. Um, exactly how to describe him is rather more difficult. He is a musician. He is a composer. He specializes in interactive music. He has worked on many early experiments in Second Life where sound responds to avatar presence, things like that. But more recently, he's been uh, working outside the immersive environment and creating immersive experiences for uh, mobile devices like the iPhone and iPad. Um, he is responsible for a very popular um, app called um, RJ DJ, um, another one called, I think it's DJ Journeys, and uh, he also was behind uh, Inception, the app, which was a sort of time with the Inception movie, and he has just released a brand new app, which... Um, refers to itself as sounds for the multiverse, if I've got it right, as opposed to the metaverse, um, and that's called Dimensions. So, uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome him. Um, his real name is Robert Thomas. I think that's where we get the R in RJDJ, I'm not sure. And he's known in world, uh, in Second Life, as Dizzy Banjo. And I'm going to throw it over to him to sort of introduce himself and give a little bit of history before we get down to the nitty-gritty of our chat. So, welcome, Dizzy, and uh, it's over you <laughs> great thanks mel for that uh, kind introduction and then um, hello to everyone here with us um so um yeah i mean that's that's almost correct <laughs> as, a, as a description <laughs> of what i've done i guess close um, enough <laughs> there's a few things i guess i'd, I'd sort of, uh, maybe explain yeah. a little bit more but um sure. so yeah i, I guess uh uh, probably around 2005, 2006, I started to, um, you know, explore Second Life really because I think um, really around, especially around that time in um, 2007, there, I guess there was this obvious kind of um, huge focus on possibilities of what Linden Lab were doing with this and, and where that might go. <clears throat> um, and I think at that time there was a lot of, people doing a lot of different things with um, virtual environments um, and in a weird way uh, I was kind of interested in that but at the same time I was really not necessarily that focused on whether this is like I guess a kind of all solving technology which is going to be the future of everything uh, I think I was a lot more interested in a way uh, in um, you know what is unique about it um and you know and and as a musician and a composer uh there are a lot of things which um you can do uh with a kind of shared virtual experience which are yeah it's kind of it, only second life can do that now you know it isn't, there hasn't really been something which can um, can replace that so um so i guess over a, a a few years really i i i started to create interactive musical and and sound experiences in here which are i guess kind of uh, somewhere between um uh sort of instruments where you're 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 kind of creating something that a series of avatars play together mm. and 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 between that and and a kind of song really um so i did a whole lot of work like that and did some stuff uh for like some countries, like I did a, a soundtrack for Mexico and one for oh, Costa yeah. Rica. 
Um, and then, uh, and then I also did a lot more experimental kind of um, in, interactive stuff. Like I did a um, uh, a thing with Princeton University, which was a kind of big installation thing that you flew around in, and it made different sounds when you're doing it. Um, and this kind of, I think the most interesting one maybe that I did was um, a way that uh, you could, different people could hook up the, the voice client here in Second Life to to move around objects, like virtual objects inside here. And yeah. um, and when that happened, they would they would generate a kind of soundtrack, a different soundtrack based on the conversation that these people were having. So it was really a kind of, translation of a conversation into a musical form and it was a bit game like as well because there was a kind of combination that you had to to uncover through your 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 com- conversation i remember us all seeing around in that and trying to work yeah I, I just think <laughs> I, remem- I remember being in that <laughs> yeah it was uh, and like uh, that one of the kind of guests here in the studio chance abattoir which i have to say made the probably the most complimentary comment about that piece I think that like anyone has ever said about anything I've done in in virtual worlds at least whereas he said uh, he said that this is what I imagined the metaverse to look like I think I think that's what he said um and I think that was it was really interesting because the there's a whole load of stuff you know that you know the beginnings of second life presented a huge opportunity and and in many ways uh, it really did just become a kind of second life a sort of second representation of normal life for in in a lot of areas of second life um whereas you know a lot of, some of the projects like that parsec project we were just discussing i think mm. you know what we really tried to do there was make something that was totally totally different from normal reality and was totally impossible in in normal reality you know yeah so that was a big thing so for when he said that for me <laughs> i i also remember uh, well there's a uh, dinoflor is another one that keeps it, it, it sort of keeps coming around um yeah it, that, it, was, uh, that was that was this uh, Doug, Doug story it? yeah um these two uh, it's like a kind of pair um artistic team with um a uh, guy, uh, Douglas Story. He's he, he's actually, uh, I think he's a photographer and a, um, an editor, um, but he's, I think he, uh, uh, he's got a very kind of strong interest in interactive, kind of virtual art, and he works with a scripter called Desdemona Enfield, who, um, uh, who basically, um, kind of scripts a lot of the stuff, how the interaction works, and we also did this huge kind of um landscape around it which someone called Poid Mahoblish designed and then I did a whole load of sort of interactive sound stuff for it and uh, yeah that was that's been I reincarnated have... about three or four times now I think that project yeah it seems quite recent there was another one and uh, of course I've also got fond memories of the um back in the days of I guess it was Nick Wilson and Metaverse uh, I, it, we, we, I think we were both part of a rather sort of um, crowd at that time, and I remember then there was a sort of meta of everything, wasn't there? It was metanomics, and you formed <laughs> meta, we formed meta music, if I remember rightly. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I think there was, um, um, there was a, yeah, yeah, definitely a sort of, um, uh, I mean, around that time, there was a huge, uh, a huge number of people that were, you know, they were really, um, really interesting group of people, which, um, and it, 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 I think what what was great is you could have amazing conversations with people from all over the world that were, you know, they weren't like on on Facebook or Twitter or something where you have these kind of fragmented sort of pieces mm. of of little fragments of conversation and and it, it it was sitting down in the room with these amazing thinkers from all over the world, you know, and because Second Life is a synchronous thing and it, it's it's a kind of it really is like sitting down in a room with people. Yeah, it's, you know, it's slow paced. It's each person talking one at a time, and you have a, a coherent debate about something, you know, which can last for hours. It was it was an amazing time, really, because it was all of the kind of people who were really trying to push things all together in 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 a room, really, in a way. Yeah. And uh, 
and and it's a, it, it is a little bit of a shame that that's kind of fragmented in a way. Um, it's the, due to the, the sort of I, the media mm-hmm. landscape, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it probably still exists in some ways, but I mean, you know, you get these groups, and you know, as time goes by, people go into other things, mm. and um, you know, I just, uh, I feel you particularly. I mean, I've um, obviously moved on into a wide variety of other things, um, you know, since that time. Um, it, it, it's very interesting, actually, because um, as I say, we we focus on the, the, the things like the hypergrid and the greater metaverse here rather than, say, Second Life in particular, though we obviously pay homage to it and film in Second Life. But um, I've, I'm, I've always felt that, um, uh, well, one of the phrases I come up with, put it that way, is that um, immersive spaces, uh, virtual worlds, if you like, are in some ways a place to slow down. Uh, you can come in, you can collaborate, you can slow down. And although we we see the rise in mobile tech and many of the other things you're doing now, um, it's um, it's actually the opposite of the the immersive space because you feel like you're coming in here to literally slow down and chill out a bit and meet people and discuss at a kind of normal pace. Whereas when you're on the uh, social networks, it is just frantic. It's more noise than signals, I tend to say. And, mm. um, you know, um, I think, I, you know, although that is big and that is taking off, and as um, my friend Philippe Took said on the show a few weeks ago, um, it's actually allowing us time to get it right, you know, not worried about being hijacked by mobile. But um, I, I, I think there's going to come a point where people are just going to get burnt out with all the all the rapidity of data that's coming over the networks now. Um, and yeah, gonna well, I think it. that yeah, I think it's kind of um, it's easy to sort of um, uh, to classify everything that happens in say the mobile space together into one thing, really, um, and and in a way. Uh, Apple sort of doesn't really help that process, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but like in a in a in a way, it's like so. Say Twitter and Facebook, and and you know, say the way that the the gaming is going, for instance, on on mobile devices is you know being driven towards these very tight kind of defined experiences. Which and what the people are aiming at is is like these tiny fragments of time that people have on the bus, or you know when they're going you know to work or something or and and they're kind of capitalizing on that these fragments over time and you're right in saying that it is you know very fast paced in and out in kind of two minutes or less and and the kind of interaction is is fragmented and incoherent so um i mean that's the the consequence of um that type of design really but uh, i think that like what we're doing and maybe i should kind of give a bit of background now about rj dj but i think what yeah, we're trying was, to do yeah i was actually going to say if you uh, i mean we could almost fast forward to uh, uh, the new app dimensions here because one yeah. of the things it does um if you put aside the rather annoying female voice <laughs> is it gives you continuity of sound despite um other things you may be doing so you can be flipping around um on something like the ipad um doing all that um hurry stuff jumping from one thing to another but you have this soundtrack that keeps floating there and responds to what you're doing that is really the idea of um uh, yeah. what you're tackling there isn't it well i think that um yeah. So I mean maybe I should explain a little bit about um about RJ DJ. So yeah. uh so RJ DJ actually stands for um well the first two letters stand for reality jockey. So um basically uh RJ DJ was founded um in 2008 by a guy called Michael Breidenbrucker who is um he's actually one of the the co-founders of Last FM. And um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I should say at this point, I'm I'm really not kind of, uh, (laughs) I'm really not responsible for the production of those apps. It's like a a kind of team of people, really. And and I actually joined RJ DJ a a year or or so after the formation of the company. But um, I think that, uh, you know, I think what we're trying to do with RJ DJ really is something which is, is in a way slow 
uh, in the way that you're talking about and is is kind of focused on a, a quality kind of personalized experience um, so what I mean by that is is I can probably explain that first of all by talking about what we do with music so um, obviously um, you know Michael founded Last FM and Last FM is really about um, I guess it's kind of about personalizing music down to the level of the song so instead of listening to um, a, you know albums or something or like going through trawling through loads of other stuff it's a recommendation engine which personalizes music for you on a song by song basis and um, you know a number of years later after last FM he he wanted to do a project which personalized music within the song itself so every moment it was uh, uh, it was providing the right mu music for that moment and um, and I guess that's really what RJDJ is all about so to describe it what it does is it takes all of the sensors on the iPhone including the microphone um, but it, so that means the accelerometer so it can tell how it's moving uh, the GPS so it can tell where you are it can tell how fast you're moving um, the internet so it can pull all kinds of information about that place where you are like is it raining there or is it night or is it full moon at the moment um, and uh, you know the touch screen obviously um, and then it kind of triangulates across all of this information and uses all of that information to inform what the music is going to be at that moment in time uh, so uh, a lot of the experiences that people have with RJ DJ feel like they are in immersed inside of a piece of music, which they're kind of navigating around by their actions. Mm. And it's, it is a very kind of um, personal and specific uh, experience. And, and most importantly, it's a passive experience, which you have alongside your 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 real life. And in um, in 2009, the uh, science fiction author referred to RJ DJ as um, augmented sound and uh, yeah. or kind of augmented sonic reality. Yeah. And uh, so it, it really is. I think what we're trying to do in in many ways is is augmented reality. But instead of doing visual augmented reality, which is clearly at this moment in time technologically way a bit way off um we're, we're doing it now but with sound because sound is, is much easier to do technically but also in a weird way because it runs as a layer over your 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 physical um perception it's 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 kind of easier to handle as well because you can you can have uh, audio cues in there which don't interfere with your visual kind of cues mm. so like if you fast forward through um, RJ DJ, we did um, in 2010. We did this project with Chris Nolan and Zimmer for Inception, and what we really tried to do there was <clears throat> um, personalize a music experience um, based on different activities that the person is doing at that time. So, for instance, if you're sitting still, then it knows that and it makes the music kind of calm. If you stand up and go for a walk, then the music will immediately start getting drums and and start getting more active, and it actually uses some of this this you know sequence from the action action sequence in the film. And then, if uh, it's night when you're using it, then you'll go into a special kind of um, sleep a sleep dream, <laughs> which is uh, each each one of the musical experiences is called a dream in Inception, obviously, because it's all about yeah. dreams. Uh, and then there's a kind of full moon dream. There's a dream for when you go to the airport because there's a big airport sequence in the film. Um, there's a, a, a sequence for when you're traveling, so that a traveling dream, which is um, detected by GPS poles to detect that you're going over 30 miles an hour. And then it puts you into this special traveling dream. There's a, a shared dream, which you can have if somebody else is using the app near you, like physically near you. Um, and then there's, there's a whole lot of other things, even as, as extreme as a dream which you can only experience when you're in the continent of Africa, which oh. has got, a, got us a whole load of uh, 
frustrated use of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah. So, um, so Inception was, you know, for us was a kind of a breakthrough thing, really, because up until Inception, we had, as say, I don't know, three hundred thousand kind of user base, something like that, or four hundred thousand. Um, but uh, Inception is now about four point two million downloads, and um, and the, the the amazing thing about it is um, the kind of continued usage of it is uh, is extremely long. So each session time, and this is this is the difference between what we're doing on the iPhone, say, and and uh, many other uh, iPhone apps like say Angry Birds, for instance. Session times. Uh, the average session time is about 30 minutes. So like listening to music in a way, the, this experience, even though it's is partially active and partially passive, is a very long kind of average session time. Um, and the long session times are huge. They're like eight hours. In, in, the, in the case of Inception, is people using it all day at work. There's a kind of background ambient kind of thing. Um, and literally sleeping with the app on all of the time. So, um, you know, it's kind of crazy. Uh, I think we've got something like 300, 304 total years of, of, uh, of dream time across all of the users now, uh, which is a bit mind-blowing. <laughs> no, I know, the mind boggles, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So now, like a year later after doing Inception, we've launched this thing called Dimensions. <clears throat> and um, again, Hans Zimmer worked on one of the dimensions, the music for one of the dimensions for this app. And um, and I did uh, all of the other stuff, basically, with with you know with the rest of the guys at RJDJ as well. And, um, and uh, you know, we've got a team of six people, basically, at RJDJ, which we put all of these apps together with. And... Uh, and dimensions, the, the story of dimensions really is that it's about moving between different dimensions in, a, in the multiverse, which is, you know, all of this kind of quantum, <laughs> quantum theory stuff that's going around at the moment about the, the, the world consists of different dimensions in a multiverse. And we're, I guess we're going to get into that kind of story. Um, and the idea is that um, not only do you, you move around these dimensions by doing things in your life and you know there are different kind of challenges to getting to them now so there are ones where you have to get up you know and watch the sunrise in order to get into the orient dimension for instance um there's ones like uh so that there are kind of <coughs> if you're um connected via facebook so connected via facebook with a load of people then you can get into some uh and in the in in some of the future updates, there's some quite interesting sort of contexts that um, it's detecting about about you, basically, um, which let you go into these different dimensions. And um, we've sort of added another layer over it. And the interesting this is, I guess, is a, a very interesting thing in relation to virtual worlds, in a sense. <clears throat> so what we're starting to reach towards now is that it's a game which you play in a out in your physical life you know <clears throat> so it's a game we play by being still or running or being waiting till it's full moon or watching the sunrise or all of these different things but then there are these virtual objects that are part of that game as well mm. and the, um, the thing that we're interested in there is positioning those in the world around you and uh, uh -huh. so right now um, it's quite a simple kind of system I think that we're, we've kind of implemented but so there are these artifacts which you, when you're in dimensions, you, you go about and, and collect. And um, they get positioned on a, a Google map which is pulled, of your, pulled at your location when you're playing the game. And um, the idea is that these are the beginnings of um, virtual objects which are placed around the player in their real environment. Um, and there are also these kind of monsters there called the Nephilim. And if you, if you don't deal with those, then basically... <laughs> get you and take all of your artifacts and throw you out of the dimension so um so in it you know even though it's i mean this is a very crude simple sort of first step towards exploring this kind of audio augmented reality kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you said you mentioned the narrator earlier on so i mean she's a kind of a virtual kind of character really who's there in inside of the game kind of 
helping you understand what's going on. And, you know, I guess we are kind of at the moment, uh, you know, exploring the balance of that with the passive experience as well. Um, and But I think it's all about, in a way, it's very similar to a lot of things that happen in virtual worlds, um, except instead of you you projecting into what we're doing right now, which is into avatars in order to experience that virtual space and those virtual objects, the virtual objects in the space are, are reaching out and, and are around you in, in reality. So the, this is the kind of... Um, the flip of the sort of uh, the the metaphor, which is which we're interested in exploring. It's really funny. I've been uh, I've been um, playing around with it, really, just getting to know it. Um, in what? Well, uh, yeah, uh, I last, saw you. Uh, I saw yeah, you in I've, collective dimension earlier. Uh, um, well, I can't I, actually. No, I couldn't for a long while get into the collective dimension because uh, I now have four or five Facebook friends, which, given the number of people I <laughs> who follow me, would seem rather odd. But um, it, it's funny though. You should say that because um, um, uh, uh, my colleague Tara, who you you know as well um is actually the one who's really done more exploring than me on this but um when when i finally realized i could press on that circle and get the map i had visions of having to go out the door with this ipad and cross high park to get to the artifact mm -hmm. uh, before i realized that actually i just put my finger there and pull it into my inventory yeah. <laughs> you know well, so i, mean, I thought it was actually going to take me walking for a while which is yeah, yeah. fascinating in its own right you know yeah yeah i mean that's i think that you know obviously we're balancing the the game experience and making it you know there's there's a balance between catering towards people who would want to play a, a, a pervasive game, which is what you're describing there, really, where people, you really say, no, you have to go to Hyde Park to pick this thing up, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and making something which is more friendly to the mainstream um, iPhone user base, which are basically used to sitting on a bus and playing Angry Birds. So yeah. uh, we're, we're kind of struggling and kind of exploring this balance between the two at the moment. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, that's a very difficult thing to do because they're, they're kind of almost polar opposites in a way. But in another sense, it's also a very interesting thing to do because what it, what it does is it really um, it brings what's, uh, what's actually a very unusual and almost avant-garde experience at one end, which is kind of what our sonic experiences can be like. Um, it brings that to a very mainstream uh, audience. And, and for us, I think that's a, a, a kind of key thing. It's a very interesting kind of um, combination. Yeah. Oh, I'm envious of those download figures for one thing. Okay. Um, while um, I've got you on this subject, actually, because we, we've got some heftier sort of things uh, to do with virtual goods and stuff to discuss. But um, I noticed that... Um, as well as dimensions of all this, you have actually been popping back into Second Life um, a fair bit recently. And uh, have you, uh, were you involved with some soundtracks um, quite recently over the LEA, is it? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, uh, a while back now, it was quite a long time ago, I think, they asked me to... Um, when uh, It was really a long time ago, actually, when um, Mark Kington was... Uh, kind of setting up the the LEA. The, this is the, the Linden Endowment ah. for the Arts, which is a, a a kind of body which it was actually originally um, completely run by by Linden, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it's become really now a kind of resident or organised, but Linden yeah. kind of sponsored thing, mm -hmm. and uh, they set up a, a committee which was. Um, uh, which was a series of people who had some kind of expertise in different areas of, of Second Life art, really. <clears throat> and uh, they asked me to get involved as, in terms of sound. And um, uh, so uh, I, I tried to really help there for, for a while, but basically um, RJ DJ was making, you know, <laughs> it was impossible. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't really kind of dedicate enough time to do that. So I yeah. uh, became more like a consultant, really, or advisor. And, and what they've been doing since then is, is really, I mean, some of it that I've seen has been really great, the way that they've mm. 
pulling together different types of art and different types of artists and, and give a showcase. And um, and actually, recently we have had some discussions about something that is focused on sound, which might be uh, some kind of interesting, um, almost like a kind of. Uh, I mean, what I'd love to do would be uh, something which um, really kind of sums up all of the possibilities of of second life in particular that are unique mm. in in relation to music and sound uh, yeah. and and really i mean i've spoken actually already to a, a couple of um artists who who actually no longer do things in second life but did some really great work in 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 the kind of earlier days and um i think that it would be great to kind of pull all of that stuff together and and kind of show it because <clears throat> in a way that that's the sad thing really is that when a lot of artists kind of move on then their work really isn't around to be seen anymore you know this is um actually this is a, a, a um i'll divert this here a bit it's a great opportunity to do it really it's a good segue um one of the things we're, we're very keen on here at, you know is looking at the hypergrid and the open sim environments and um Increasingly, especially now, Second Life has these things like mesh coming in, which actually require you really uh, to author and create out of world and then import. It also gets over a lot of copyright problems because if you create it all out world and import it, you know damn well it's yours. <laughs> mm. And you know, you've got copies, you can then um, res or whatever the expression for what you're doing is on um, an open simulator. And of course, you can use, uh, um, you know, people can use OpenSim. It looks and behaves much like Second Life to actually do the work that they then package up and import in Second Life. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I, I do know that a few things that have disappeared from Second Life, for example, have literally been packaged up and then rebuilt and recreated for, you know, on an OpenSim. It might even be a home installation of OpenSim where it costs nothing more than your normal internet connection. So mm -hmm. there are ways of archiving these projects and. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're certainly hoping that with the hypergrid, which connects grids together, you know, in the same way I can have a, a broadcast studio in a reaction grid and people can hypergrid in from any other grid, except Second Life, of course, <laughs> um, yeah. equally, there could be an art installation on its own server somewhere that um, people can just hypergrid from wherever they are into, even if it's on somebody's private server, examine the piece of art, the installation, if you will and then teleport out again and um, the cost of hosting that is really just uh, the space on uh, an old computer in somebody's home you know uh, half the open sims run on old Pentium 4s people have got lying around yeah. um, have you, have you guess... ever I was just going to say have you ever done anything on the open sim um, platforms well I mean I think it was really at a point where it was kind of just about tolerable <laughs> when, I, when I was kind of <laughs> dragged into another world of development really and mm. I mean I guess I mean that's one I should that's one thing I should say really is that you know it's not really that um, I don't want to be exploring virtual uh, immersive virtual stuff like this right now mm. um, it really I mean in 2008 and late 2008 I was really kind of sort of dragged into another world <laughs> and um <laughs> And and basically, you know, there was so much work to do at RJ DJ that I just couldn't do anything else. And yeah. um, and I think uh, so. You know, I think uh, I, I, at that right at that time, things weren't really mature enough to be um, to be that interesting um, from a creative point of view because so many things were broken in, on the server side. Um, but uh, I, I guess now it's probably all sorted out, or a bit more sorted out. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I, actually, I remember you were part of rocking the Metaverse tour we did with some Warrior and a few other people. And of course, back in those days, you were there as a musician, and it, a lot of the grids were unusable. Uh, we really got into a few pickles with that, didn't we? I remember. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of thinking that at the time, like the interesting. Well, I don't know. I guess it's still true, really. It's that. I mean. You know, the interesting thing about them is, I mean, it's, it's great to be able to have all of this different stuff and the, the sort of dream of a a huge interconnected sort of web of different spaces which feel like one 
continuous space mm. which is joined is very interesting um but uh, at the same time one of the most interesting things i think about what linden lab have done is this kind of self-contained thing self-contained world which and and, and obviously and I th you know the economy is such an interesting part of that that's something that um i actually as a sort of some uh, as someone who was trying to make uh, interactive artworks i guess in here i never really got involved in that when i was you know in in those few years um but the whole time i was i was actually really interested in it and and i think that that's that's what's actually one of the most interesting uh things here is that the economy and and its relation to say what prims are and what land is and what what the value is of people's creativity and and how that all kind of flows around the community here it's a it, you know that's like a, a really interesting factor which uh, it would be extremely difficult to replicate that across a lot of separate completely disparate grids which don't have control systems so yeah you know i mean that's that's a that's the sort of um that's that's one of the sort of things that you know I, I think is um you know we were talking about this the other day that like uh in a weird way it's like um the economy here obviously is uh i mean it's not like it's a small thing but obviously if you compare it to the app store it's kind of you would immediately think well well i mean the app store is enormous and it and it is kind of enormous but at the volume. same time yeah <laughs> but it, it has enormous volume yeah so i mean at the same time um uh you know you can make something here and and i remember a lot of people um and i guess people still do sort of kind of whine a bit about what the price is of 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 things in here and you make something and then you sell it and you get whatever linden dollars <clears throat> you might be lucky to get kind of you know one dollar or something <laughs> uh, uh, but but people will say that that's really bad but then you know there are thousands and thousands of uh 99 cents apps in the app store which have yeah. a huge amount of work done on them um there are you know uh, thousands of uh, free apps which have a absolutely huge amount of work done on them and and uh and um you know are trying to monetize through in-app purchases or something and and your kind of chance of success in the app store and the uh the sort of potential sort of reward that you get versus the amount of work that you have to put in in order mm -hmm. to achieve that is extremely difficult at the moment and i think it's a you know i think apple are in not really not in a good place with that i think they need to change the app store like fundamentally really um and you know what what amazes me when i look at second life now and i i come back and see what linton lab really did there and and what you know especially in the very early days of when they set up the original land model and you know when they kind of moved towards that and they they, they looked at what what it would cost for people to to have a chance to build stuff and sell stuff and kind of have a piece of land and and have their uh, and sort of participate in an economy and and you know I think that's a really amazing thing they did there and they 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 have actually maintained quite high value um, mm. for your effort the amount of effort that you put in you can achieve a reasonable amount of value from that uh, within this economy and that's still maintained now. Uh, whereas the App Store is not, that hasn't happened with the App Store. No. It's actually rather odd you mention that, <coughs> Big, <coughs> pardon me, uh, because in Second Life specifically, there's a little bit of a ruckus at the moment um, because the, the figures are showing that day by day more people are using uh, Second Life's marketplace and they're not buying in world. And of course, you know, um, it means Linden as the marketplace is doing very well, but it means that Linden as reliant on people having shops and having boutiques to sell things in 
uh, means that um, the, the land demand for shops and things is, is falling <laughs> because people are, are selling via the marketplace. And the marketplace, <laughs> to me, looks like, I, I think I'm right in saying it looks a bit like the app store, you know, <laughs> that mm. you are just swamped uh, with how much is there and you, you mm. often can't get demos and you, um, um, you know, it's, uh, there's not enough detail to tell one app apart from another. And, um, you know, there are great similarities there. Uh, which yeah. is really where the platform owner is sort of taking over the delivery well, systems. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it has to be a mixture of a lot of different things for uh, for for something to really work as a kind of uh, yeah as a as a marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I think like it's good that personally, I think that the move to have a marketplace is a good idea because it means that you can have you know all kinds of things that are uh, are, are very difficult to do in a, a synchronous kind of continuous single location sort of mm -hmm. virtual space so you can have you know um, recommendations and you can have like seeing lots of things at once you can kind of move around them very quickly you can you know have overview and you can have sort of user charts you can have your friends charts you can have uh, like all kinds of stuff um, mm -hmm. but at the same time it's kind of useless in a way in relation to, to uh, virtual worlds because you, you know the whole thing with a what you what you want to experience of the thing you're going to buy is is something which is a three dimensional thing. So, mm -hmm. like I I have a few things that I I have like so in some interactive kind of sound stuff, which I'll I'll kind of you know have on in a in a little shop somewhere, and then um, have those in the marketplace. But there's just no point really. It's not going to be a purchase that comes from the marketplace for that stuff because. The whole thing of understanding why you want to buy it is the, is the actual kind of interactive experience, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So the only way you can get that is, uh, you know, by seeing the thing and, and playing around with it in a piece of, in virtual space. So, um, so I think it it's always going to have to be a combination of the two, you know, for for Linton Lab mm -hmm. and for that to work. I mean, it's going to be, yeah, I mean, I, I can understand why that would be a very difficult and dangerous thing for them to fiddle around with too much, you know. Mm. Yeah, you can't please all the people all the time. So, I mean, hopefully they're just trying yeah. to drive the past down. Well, I mean, it's, 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 for the most, it's critical for them in the, in, in, in the most sort of, uh, obviously it's going to uh, ir irritate or please a lot of different um residents and but uh, at the same time it's, it has a huge impact on for them like you're saying about land 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 demand you know mm. okay well um it's amazing how time flies when we're talking on this program i'd like to move the the conversation a bit more um more abstract and a bit more personal here now um if if that's okay, okay. with you because i know we've been through this on um in various uh, mm -hmm. conversations we've had recently anyway uh you've you're you're in um a very unique position i know you have some strong opinions on this where you obviously get the metaverse, you get Second Life, you've been here, you've done it all, and whatever. Um, as we say, these things do slow us down, and maybe the immer you know, that you can only take so much immersion when you've got a lot of things to do, so you've been hijacked by RJ DJ, etc. But, um, over and beyond that, um, we're, we're, I know we've had some conversations about the your your feelings about the way the metaverse may take off or may not take off and as is perceived by the greater public and um you felt that since you had spent a large amount of time outside second life i mean not abandoned it but sort of not been around so much because of other things sure, yeah, yeah. you were getting a new perception on things that you you were seeing a different way while you were involved in the immersive environment so much so um mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite keen to sort of explore this i mean um I, i'll just say that i think the the metaverse as we call it and mercy spaces are here to stay but i don't think the public take up um is going to be as fast as expected and i think um a lot of the ecological advantages like you know if you can meet in virtual space you can cut down on burning fossil fuels and stuff like that um mm. you know people of mobile technology has 
increasingly shown us that people are going to keep moving around and burning fossil fuels and commuting and things like that. So a lot of the idealistic things that we wanted to happen here, I think still will happen eventually. But I think people are maybe some people are even just nervous about the um, the psychological bridge you have to cross to put yourself in an immersive environment. But I'd like really to just sense your thoughts on A, where the future of um, immersive environments may be going, and B, your personal, how should I say, um, re-assessment uh, of the situation, as it were, in mm. a, a, um, a, as a result of working on your own kind of immersive apps. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, um, so, I mean, um, I think that... Uh, in order to understand why I, I kind of think about this, um, I, I think it's it's more it's more like a, a sort of if if you look at um, say Second Life in particular, but um, virtual spaces where the mode of interaction is is this is this type of mode that we're all doing right now, basically, which is. Um, you know, I guess that most of us, in in reality, are sitting down somewhere, and we have been for at least an hour now, and we're we're sitting at probably quite a powerful device, which um, is something that was uh, really designed for uh, a world which um, which was really sent centered around that type of device in, in terms mm. of computing you know um and uh and we're all looking at a screen a, a kind of a big screen which means that basically uh, and and we've gone through a, a, a really big process of doing something which you're right and totally correct in saying that um many people <coughs> find very challenging which is kind of um, to uh, allow yourself to completely immerse in a, uh, an avatar and allow that to be expressive of you, <clears throat> which is as a whole subject in itself, <laughs> and yeah. uh, and uh, and and to um, and and for for that to um, to be your kind of mode of uh, you know interaction and sort of yeah. ex experiencing that. Um, and because the because the way that uh, because that that is the the sort of framework of it, and and the way that it works, it really is you know, in 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 this sense, it's uh, the word second life is good. I mean, it's in some ways I don't like that, but in this sense, it is. It's a kind of it's a it's a separate detached version of a of a reality and Philip always used to say that he was kind of building a, a world in digital atoms you know and yeah. that that is something which you know that that's kind of what this is obviously it's a, a separate virtual space which you know I can remember when I'd be building projects I would and I'm sure all of us in a sense have had this that you would and you get it by playing video games as well but like you dream that space you have a dream in there and you when you have the dream you you feel you don't dream that you're sitting in front of a machine you dream that you're in that space you know absolutely yeah and um and uh so and that process itself so that whole thing i've just described is amazingly suited to a world of the world of really 2003 2004 2005 something like that and um that's you know and and that combination of um in a way i don't know lots of different factors um but the combination of what everyone was doing at that time and and what um and the technology at the time um the kind of the zeitgeist i guess the the um the sort of uh the uh the the feeling in the, the investor community in around 2000 i guess uh the tech startup industry and what they thought was a great idea <laughs> which is mm. a, in itself is a big sort of lottery 
Um, and, you know, all of these things conspired to, um, to sort of form a, a pedestal underneath Second Life and, and, and put it in this unattainable, um, unsustainable position, basically. I think this has kind of happened, really. Um, and, you know, so I think what happened after that is something where all of these crazy sort of expectations and, like, projections and trajectories were sort of imagined. And it's kind of like I was saying earlier, really. A lot of things happened which really um, projected that this was, you know, something that was kind of definite and and kind of uh transformative and 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 would be a kind of a very specific path that a lot of things would definitely move along <clears throat> and um but you know what what i guess really didn't um come into those kind of uh calculations was a number of different things so um if we talk about like mobile, for instance, a transformation from what Steve Jobs, I guess, called the kind of PC era to the post PC era, and um, and uh, and that's kind of underway now, I think, um, and it's it, it just means that there's there's a different area of of activity with computers that's happening. It's not about people sitting at, uh, on a sort of mm. device which is you know. Is stationary or even on a laptop, it's something that's like continually flowing around them and is kind of with them all of the time and fills all these little fragments of time. But it's also filling a kind of passive layer that goes over the top of everything they do, which is, I guess, what we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> and the opportunities there and the excitement and the buzz around those those kind of opportunities is just uh, is very interesting for for kind of the early adopters, I think. But it's also, in a, in a different way from Second Life, it's very interesting for the mainstream as well. And um, so I think because the difference between that buzz and the Second Life buzz is that in this, in this buzz, there isn't a scary thing that they have to do, which is yeah. uh, it's do that kind of immersive thing um, there isn't a, a time thing, which is the kind of slow sort of mm. pace of this, which, I mean, I, I think that's great, and we've kind of discussed I, that. Mm. So, you know, I think that the, the difference is, is not, um, it's not necessarily about what Second Life is, although I think there are a lot of issues about Second Life which need to be <laughs> sorted out. Um, but it's more to do with the world, that the world changed around yeah. it. You know, I, um, I, I th you know, I think, um, you know, people who develop technology and things like that are very influenced by science fiction. And I, I often look to things like Star Trek, you know, where, um, you know, I wonder if those programs hadn't existed or the, the, the writers hadn't dreamt up the concepts, whether we, you know, the people that have invented things, um, you know, combined to where we come now uh, mm. would have done it the same way. But quite frankly, you look at iPads, iPhones, um, Android things, everything else, as you say, no longer the powerful sitting behind the desktop thing. And we are talking the communicator that um, you always saw in mm. Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, the, 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 another parallel in Star Trek, of course, is the fact that they were in a, a spaceship and therefore they were limited as to where they could travel. Mm -hmm. So they also had the holodeck. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting that last week Sony demonstrated the first consumer holodeck. Mm -hmm. um, and it all, of course, ties in with Sony Home and mm -hmm. the relaunch of Sony Home and um, also uh, reacting to Microsoft's Connect business and everything else and i actually wonder if the immersion level um firstly um it's very hard to persuade people to use virtual worlds for things when they don't see a need if they can get in the car and go somewhere they will go to a meeting if they weren't allowed to get in the car and go to a meeting then they might take the step yeah. to go to a meeting in world but um so you know um while we're still mobile, um, it seems natural that these devices, you know, communication devices come first to us. But I'm beginning to think that the, um, the key to immersion as a, a more mass market 
um, concept, maybe through things like Sony and maybe even Microsoft Xbox, where you actually take the immersive metaphor of the screen. You know, you, um, mm. your menu system, when you turn it on, will be a virtual room. It would just be your mm. personal room. It may not even be actively online, but you choose to switch on the TV from the room, the, the virtual mm -hmm. room. And, you know, the, certainly the user interface designers are coming up with this um, uh, merging of, of things, you know, so that the mm -hmm. TV will also be the web and it will also have a Twitter connected to the show you're watching, etc., etc. And I'm not a big fan of conventional television, but I wonder maybe if, if that sort of thing... Um, will be um, the, the, the key to mix and matching, so to speak. And whether, you know, it, Apple TV, presumably you'll be able to, you know, if you can't do it yet, you'll be able to run Dimensions and various other apps um, on your TV. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it may all come together a bit like that. Uh, well, if you respond to that, but also I've suddenly realized we're five minutes to the hour, time flies. Um, I have one thing that I always like to do with my guests here, actually, and that is put them on the spot at the very end. I mean, we've, we've covered some pretty large range of stuff here. Mm -hmm. But the thing I really like to ask at the end of every, each of these shows, uh, what are your uh, um, greatest... Um, aspirations and fears um, or anything really what is uh, it, not just where do you think it's going on, uh, going but also where would you like it to be going and, and any fears you might have as to the way we're going I know that's a handful but yeah. <laughs> uh, I think well I think I mean I'm kind of generally sort of pretty optimistic really I mean there are some we were to actually before we started the show we were okay, having a little bit of chat about um Facebook are doing at the moment and 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 what's interesting there and it's very exciting and but it's also in a way kind of scary is this idea that not only do you say that you know you like something <laughs> but you say that you know it, you, you say everything that you do so you say I'm I'm reading this book or I'm listening to this music or I'm kind of eating this thing or I'm kind of you know whatever it is you're doing I'm you sort of your whole life is kind of life logged into Facebook, really, and um, you know, I mean, that's that's an amazingly challenging and, and interesting set of possibilities. Um, in a po if you use it in a positive way, uh, you know, the chance to really understand what people are doing um, and offer them uh, content. Which is personalised perfectly mm. to what they're doing and and their taste and their kind of uh, their their history, their friends, the type of people they know, the sort of the the environment that they they're in, the you know everything about what's going on for them and even their emotional state, which is an amazingly kind of interesting area. Um, you know that sort of. Uh, that level of personalization I think is really fascinating but it's also incredibly scary potentially as well um, and and you know I'm I'm personally interested in that from a musical point of view um, I think that there's going to be all kinds of amazing things happening in that area over the next few years basically um, so yeah I mean that's probably what I'd say really is personalization is what's is is the sort of interesting thing and i, I think much of that uh much of uh, of how that happens would be using concepts that people like us would recognize as being virtual but mm. they will be in forms which we may not which most people probably wouldn't associate as being as virtual things but i think that um the, the, the way that you can represent things, um, whether it be in, within a kind of projected 3D space or a, an overlaid uh, augmented space, is a very interesting way that a lot of that um, personalization can be kind of represented, if you know what I mean. Mm. <clears throat> No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, it's, it, you know I follow technology as a... Um, 
you know, just a matter of course, uh, futurology and futurism mixed is what I call myself. And, you know, so I'm always, you know, I'm keen on all these advancements and all the interconnection. And, you know, I'm, uh, the other half of me is wandering around saying, you know, oh, we've got to protect our rights and everything else like that. So there's always going to be this fine line and we just never know what is around the corner. But, um, you know, we see server farms that um, people are actually hosting virtually. In other words, the, the operator logs into a virtual room and checks on the servers uh, from within the virtual environment. Uh, this is something we were talking about uh, the other week. So there are, you know, um, there are lots of um, ways in which the data can be, as it were, realized in a 2D format or in 3D space, I think. And mm -hmm. increasingly, they're probably coming together. Well, I, uh, we're, we're getting to the hour, I'm afraid. <laughs> so um, time has flown. Um, this has been a really interesting chat. I knew it would be before we started. So I'd really like to thank you for coming Great. on. Yeah. And, no, uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I really wish you the best of luck with Dimensions, all these new projects. I'm, I personally am fiddly with Dimensions, and I, I gather there's a whole lot. I haven't got out my first, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a slow progressive in these things. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but it's great fun, and uh, uh, I like the sound. Although I, I think there should be an option to turn the woman off. <laughs> and there, is the no yeah, oh, there, there is. There is. Oh, great. There's okay. Space up there. there is. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Well, uh, hopefully, also, we might be able to get you back at some time. This, um, I, I, for, for those watching, by the way, uh, this is the last show of the season. Of course, the uh, winter holiday break is coming up, but we will be back next year, and quite possibly we'll be bringing back some old guests and having more um, roundtable type discussions. Um, it, we will see. We will see how it evolves as time goes by. So, um, yeah, I guess um, I've. I can't announce the next show because I'm not sure when it is. It's been in New Year sometime unless we have some special come up or something. Um, but we will be back then. And um, I'd like to wish you all a great holiday season in the meantime. And so um, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dizzy once again for being here. It's been absolutely great having you. And hopefully we'll see you again cool. at some yeah. point. Yeah. Absolutely Excellent. great. Okay, um, so have a good holiday, everybody, and we will see you next year.